Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, a wonderful series in my opinion, is on the Gospel of Luke. It's a le series that we're studying between the months of April, May, and June of 2015. And this is lesson number seven in that series for May 16 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look in a number of verses. And before we begin, we ask you that you would bow your head with us as we pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening your word in freedom with no restraints of any kind, <coughs> being able to read it in multiple languages, different translations, and getting the wonderful insights that you intended for us to have right here from this book. Help us now to try to see things through the eyes of your friend, Dr. Luke. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Jesus came down to this earth to live as a human being, he in effect broke up the Trinity. Or did he? Can a Trinity still exist if one is a human being? with the limitations of time and space that we have and the other two are omniscient all-powerful all-knowing if you can be connected some way at all times yeah and they were connected in prayer almost in all the time conne connected in prayer well <coughs> Dr. Luke mentions the Holy Spirit 17 times in his gospel and 57 times in the book of Acts. In contrast, Mary, Ma Matthew only referred to the Holy Spirit 12 times and Mark only 6 times. Doesn't mention John, who mentioned, talked about it quite a bit as well. From before Jesus' birth, the Holy Spirit was involved in the mission of Jesus. The Holy Spirit <coughs> came upon Mary and thus her son was truly the Son of God. Read about that in Luke <coughs> verse 35. More than that, this divine baby was already affecting others in his environment. When visited by Mary, the elderly Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 42. Even before he was born, she called him Lord. So how did she know that? Mary told him. Okay. You think she just walked up and said, guess what? I have God in my belly. The angel told them what they were getting, though, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, I, I try. I, maybe I'm, might have too <coughs> active an imagination, but I love to try to imagine myself in these stories. I mean, you ladies, tell me what it would be like to walk around and say, "Guess what? God is right here." <laughs> Well, you probably wouldn't tell too many people. Yeah. <laughs> no way you'd go. <laughs> probably th would think you shouldn't be pregnant. It's probably why her visit to Elizabeth may have been a great relief and release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she had, Elizabeth had a baby who wasn't supposed to be there either, right? Well, we know that. Well, let, let's look at some examples. Look at Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. <coughs> Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. Then he said to them, now this is after the resurrection. Then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms had to come true. Why, why did he say law and prophets and psalms? Those are the three divisions of the Old Testament, what Ooh. they thought of as the Bible. Okay. What was the Bible at that time? This is a very important passage because it tells us that they had, even though in those days, remember, every part of the Bible was a separate scroll. There was no books like we have now, all nicely packed together and you open up and you can go to whichever chapter you want, nothing like that. These were a pile of scrolls, but already at least some, and Jesus supports those some, had realized that there's the law which included what? Ten Commandments. 
well, not just the Ten Commandments. Yeah, the five books of Moses. Yeah. There's the prophets. Now, they divided the prophets a little different than we probably would today, but um, meant much of the center part of, of the Old Testament, and, then, and, and including this minor prophets over at the end, and the Psalms. Now, what section would be the Psalms be involved in? This is a section that was a lot of it was wisdom literature, poetry, and so forth like that. But interestingly enough, it ended up with Second Chronicles. So all the history books were there also. Mm -hmm. So then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah must suffer, must rise from death three days later, and in his name the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are a witness of these things, and I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised. And what was that? But you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. What do you think they thought when he said that? Well, look at this, Acts 1, verses 7 to 9. Jesus said to them, The times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, now in Luke it said, when the what? When the power comes down upon you? And here he says, what? The Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what do we know that happened shortly after that? Resurrection. Well, not shortly after Acts 1. Well, he was taken up. He, he was taken up. Okay, the ascension and... The and Pentecost. And then Pentecost. And what happened at Pentecost? The Holy, Holy Spirit... The Spirit came down like tongues of fire, didn't it? Well, on numerous occasions, Jesus prayed all night, consulting with the Father and the Spirit about their plans for the coming day. One of the clearest places where that's mentioned is Luke 6, verse 12. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he named apostles. Does that mean there were a lot of disciples and only 12 end up being apostles? Sounds like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, if Jesus was the divine human Son of God and he felt such a need of prayer, how much more do we need it? And this is, a, this is a tough thing for us and the busy schedules and so forth that we have in the 21st century. But listen to these words from Steps to Christ, page 95. Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in danger of growing careless and deviating from the right path. How can you have, in our generation, in our time, have unceasing prayer? Is that easy? Well, you don't have to kneel down to pray. No. It's ongoing. It's not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be constant. It has to be <coughs> progressive, consistent. Okay. One scholar put it this way, and I think he had it about right. He said, "Prayer should be thinking toward God. We should be con or as one one monk said, many many, you know." thousands, of, hundreds of years ago anyway, he said we should practice the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. I have a question. Yeah. What does it say about God for all that he is, um, that he's willing to spend consistent prayer with everyone? Amazing, huh? A couple weeks ago we studied a passage that said, God deals with each one of us as if there were no other person in the universe. Amazing. Well, that practicing the presence of God all the time, that's kind of scary. I mean, you don't want him to watch while you're doing your sins? Well, <laughs> some things, yeah. <laughs> he might see some things that maybe a little, little too intimately. Maybe. I know he sees everything anyway, but maybe that's don't why want to be we too need close. to practice the presence of God. Yes, Bob seems to me it kind of depends on how much we feel the need of something. Yeah. 
if we feel we're in control of our lives and we can make all our decisions and we can do what needs to be done, then we don't need. But if we feel that really there's a lot of things that we aren't aware of, there's a lot of factors here in other people's lives we're dealing with that we don't know anything about, and the Holy Spirit's working in their lives, and if he's working in our lives, we can be the blessing that he would like us to be. Yeah. Well, as a Greek physician and the only non-Jew writer in the entire Bible, Luke viewed the life and mission of Jesus as a miraculous, continuous cooperation between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Think about the implications of that. Despite what Jay says, he got, he got used to this presence of God. Shortly after the birth of Jesus, when he was presented at the temple in Jerusalem, Simeon appeared and took the baby in his arms. The Holy Spirit was with him and had assured him that he would not die until he saw God's salvation with his own eyes. Simeon recognized that this baby would bring salvation not only to Israel, but also to the Gentiles. Luke 2, 25 to 32. I wonder if he, if he really understood the implications of what he was saying. What do you think? I doubt it. <coughs> I mean, he had these, you know, think about this. I mean, in the Jewish society, they were so sure that it's only Jews are going to be saved. To, 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 I, to just sort of openly like that say, well, into the Gentiles, it would be considered like almost blasphemy. What was their concept of at the, in that time of the relationship of prayer? Of prayer? Well, I mean, think about the Pharisee and the and the, Repu and the publican. It, the average Jew, you think he would have prayed like a Pharisee or like a publican? Pharisee. And I might add. The Jewish male would, would, would wake up in the morning, unfortunately, and pray, Lord, I thank you that I'm, I'm not a, a Gentile, a slave, or a woman in that order. And what did Paul say in response to that as a former Pharisee? You remember? We should read that. Remember, he, what was the prayer again? I thank God. Thank that God I'm that I'm not what? A Gentile. Pharisee, slave, or a woman. Gentile, a slave, a or a woman. A Gentile, a slave, or a woman. <coughs> and Paul writes in Galatians, so there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You're all one in union with Christ Jesus. Guess what he was thinking about? <laughs> well, what would be your preference? What? What would you prefer to be one of those three rather than what you are? One of these three? Yeah. Would you prefer to be a Gentile? I am. Or a or a slave? Uh, what slave? I am. Or a, a woman? Can't qualify. Well, I. <laughs> yeah, but that's see. If you had your preference, would you prefer to be a woman? I'm thinking, the guy was just praying for things here that he was thankful for for things that he was. The way, he <laughs> the way he felt about Gentiles, about slaves, and about women. Oh, I see. Okay. Is not, not appropriate at all. Uh, I'm sorry. That's not. A little color in there I'm overlooking. Yes. I guess I see. The Holy Spirit had revealed to John, that's John the Baptist, that Jesus would be coming to him to be baptized. And John announced that to the people. Now, did John know who Jesus was? Only because the Holy Spirit had told him. Only Messiah. because the Holy, he had never seen him. They had never met. There was no, this was not some secret collusion. They had got together to try to support each other's ministry. Not at all. So John and I reading uh, Luke three sixteen. So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I am not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with what? the Holy Spirit, and fire. Wow. That fiery part, that's the scary part. That's the scary part? You know, I heard, uh, I heard a man say once, you never want to pray for patience. <laughs> you might because, get it. Huh? <laughs> because the only way you get patience is through tribulation. You know, and... and <laughs> <laughs> 
And my colleague here, I think was in our last session, our last week's uh, discussion, when we were talking about praying unceasingly and persistently, yeah. and he said, well, one of the virtues of that is sometimes you, you find another solution that you're not looking for. Yes. Um, you pray for the, I th and I think this is, I think this is one reason why a lot of people don't pray for the Holy Spirit or kind of keep that distance, mm -hmm. is because they're afraid of what the Spirit will might, come. Might ask them to do. You know, that's right, yeah. And, uh, you know, who, the people who are intimately collected with the Spirit, <clears throat> Jesus is one, Moses is one, Paul was one, mm -hmm. you know, <coughs> they didn't have a whole lot of fun in their lives. They were flogged and persecuted and misunderstood and even Moses. So maybe this praying for the Holy Spirit to, to, to have a little more uh, direction about when what ought to be doing or, or going where the Lord wants you to go, you may, maybe you don't particularly want to go there. <laughs> yes, Bob. I think that may be our external evaluation. But I think if we looked in their heart and saw what was going on in their heart and yeah. the love and the relationship that they have there, yeah. we might have an entirely different evaluation of what they went through. Not that they didn't suffer. Yeah. No, that's we, need to, we need to look at some very interesting verses. I want, to know, I want you to tell me what you, what you see here. I'm going to compare a couple of Gospels here. First, I'm going to read Luke 4, first verse. <coughs> Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was tempted by the <coughs> devil for 40 days. Okay? What does that mean? Look at Matthew 4, 1 and 2. Then the Spirit led Jesus into the <coughs> desert to be tempted by the devil. Was that, is God cooperating with the devil here? See, that proves my point. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that the direct translation, though? <laughs> that's, that's what the Greek says. <coughs> Mark 1, look at 12, Mark 1, 12 and 13. At once the Spirit made him go into the desert where he stayed 40 days, being tempted by Satan. Wild animals were there also, but angels came and helped him. So what, what, what was the purpose for these, this time in the wilderness? It, what, what's the sequence? Remember, he, he, he came down from Galilee. He was baptized by John. He disappeared into the wilderness. Interestingly enough, Ellen White says that John found him out there in the wilderness briefly, and Jesus said, go back. You don't want, it. You don't want to be here while I'm going through this. And when did the devil come to him? At the end of the 40 days. At the exactly. end of the 40 days. So what was he do, do, doing during the 40 days? Praying. Prayer. Communion. Fasting. Okay, what does prayer mean? He is spending an intensive period of time with the Father and the Holy Spirit planning his ministry. But we, we, won't, we don't have time now to talk about what happened as a result of the temptations, but there were the temptations, and then he went back to John, didn't he? It was only end, at the end of those 40 days when he was extremely hungry that the devil approaching, approached him, hoping for an opportunity to, to overcome him. From that time on, the Holy Spirit was intimately connected with the ministry of Jesus. You think the Holy Spirit was working when Jesus was still a carpenter? Yes. Absolutely. And as a child, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, think about this for a moment. Just suppose that all of us for a moment are evil angels on, this, on Satan's side. Just, we don't practice this very often, but for just now for a moment, what would you want to accomplish well, Jesus has just arrived and he's just ready to start his ministry. Okay, we're, we're plotting against Jesus. What would you say? What would you want to happen? Get at him at his lowest physical point. Get, get him at him. Sin. What? Get him to sin. Absolutely. Right, get him to show selfishness. Yeah. To provide for himself. Yeah. Yeah. Or to give up. Or to give up. There are three things that we know very clearly that Satan was hoping to accomplish. Number one prior to priority was to get Jesus to sin. If he couldn't get him to sin, number two priority was to get him to say, this trying to save human beings isn't worth it. Just give it up and go back to heaven. Forget this whole world, just let them perish or whatever. And number three, finally at the very end of his life, he's buried in the tomb 
And Satan is desperate now because he hasn't succeeded in his first two choices. So what was his third one? Keep him there. Keep, Keep him, him, him in the tomb. Him. Do not let him get out of that tomb. And when the two angels came from heaven down there and one rolled back, well, as they came down and approached the tomb, what happened to Satan and the evil angels? They scattered. I mean, we read about the hundred Roman soldiers that fell like dead men. That's nothing. Satan, his entire host was there trying to keep that great grave shut. And they just scattered. When two angels with the, God, with the Holy Spirit's power showed up, there was nothing they could do. That's, that gives you a clue about what kind of power the Holy Spirit has. I think I've heard you suggest before that on the storm on the lake, the devil tried to destroy or kill Jesus and the disciples yeah. before Gethsemane. Just, just, just think about that. If you could, He could have wiped out that whole group and just flipped that boat over maybe and wiped out the whole group in one, at one time. He would have considered it a great victory, right? A specific example of two is in coming to me. Do you have a, just to get him to go back to heaven? Where About the you, two angels? You're talking about the two angels? I know. I'm just. I'm trying oh. to think about in a, a a story where oh. Satan would. That's what his wish would be to oh. leave it alone. Uh, you you have to go to Ellen White for that. Okay. Yeah, uh, I should have put the reference in here. Yeah, uh, there's several places. It'll right. be there soon. Yeah, <laughs> Ellen White. Ellen White uh, <coughs> talks about this consistently. I mean, you could think. I mean, just logically. Yeah, I I, I believe you. I was just. Yeah. Yeah. But, and he, all three of these points are clearly in the Book of Desire of Ages. I wonder if Satan really had the understanding that all finite beings are dependent upon the, like you, Ellen White says, the pulse or the heart, every heartbeat is a reflex from the touch of the, of yeah. God. Yeah. And uh, he thinks if God go, or Jesus goes back to heaven, everything's going to be fine. But who's keeping him alive? Mm -hmm. If sin left to run its own course, it's going to collapse on itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One place that gives you a little bit of hint about, well, uh, some of this <coughs> angelic business that we've just mentioned is in Desire of Ages, page 831 to 832. And that's the place where it says specifically that Jesus, through his entire life, had two guardian angels. And one of them was Gabriel. She, she, she doesn't mention him his by name, but she says the leader of the angels. Why do you suppose he needed two of the two most powerful angels in heaven as his guardian angels? It's consistently being attacked. Yeah. Well, the devil sure likes to come from behind. Well, and I mean, I can assure, I heard one person say, and I don't, I, I'm no scholar on this particular subject, so I, I just would have to take his word for it. He said, if you look back as far as you can in recorded history, there are only 11 years when there was no war going, off, so going on somewhere in the world. And three of those years were during the ministry of Jesus. And what do you suppose the devil and all his angels were doing during those three years? They were busy with something else. They were busy. <laughs> they were very, very busy. They, I'm sure they were having war conferences every day. Okay, what can we do today? You aren't suggesting that the devil provokes war in our day, are you? Do I have to suggest that? You can say it straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> I can say it just like I that. You know, in, in reference to my, my, the, my verbalized concern that when you ask the Holy Spirit to help you or to lead you, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's a sure sign you... Trouble? You, the trouble. The two stories that you've just mentioned here um, highlight what also happens. In, in the case of, of Jesus in the, in the wilderness, there was angels that came. <coughs> and then uh, I th something that's very important to realize is was illustrated when you mentioned at the tomb mm -hmm. is when the good guys come, the bad guys run. Yeah, and that that applies specifically to Satan and his angels and to to us in any of yeah. our circumstances. If we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and help us, what happens to the devil? Has to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, may put up a fight, but well. Jesus, shortly after he began his ministry, traveled back to Nazareth. We read about it in Luke 4. And he was asked to give a presentation in the synagogue. And he stood up and he read from Isaiah. And he read a passage which everyone in the audience knew 
was supposed to be referring to the Messiah. And what did he say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then today, these words are fulfilled in your presence. In your presence. And what was he saying? I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. The Spirit was his constant companion, his affirming strength and his abiding presence among the followers when Jesus would no longer be in their midst. And of course we know that. Jesus, Jesus said in John 16, uh, 5 to 7, I did not tell you these things at the beginning, for I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asked me where I am going. And now that I have told you, your hearts are full of sadness. But I am telling you the truth. It is better for you that I go away, because if I do not go, the Helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, then, do go away, then I will send him to you. What, what does that mean? Why, why would that be true? That's not supposed to be a trick question. No, no, no. But the the Holy, Holy Spirit was already with them before. I don't think he's just saying, okay, now I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. he's, he's also going to send him, you know, the ability to decipher things properly, mm -hmm. to understand what they really needed to know that they just couldn't get before. Well, but... Let me just ask you a simple question. Mm -hmm. If Jesus, as long as Jesus was here on this earth, yeah. where did all the disciples want to be? Right where he is. Right with him. Yeah. At his feet. At his feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, I have to go. So what is the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation and how are we to relate to him? The most important thing that the Holy Spirit has done for us and is doing for us is... Bible. I can't grab this computer and hold it up. It's got a whole bunch of Bible in it, but it's the Bible. It was He was the one who inspired the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles to write the record which we have in front of us. He's the inspiration of that. But not only that, what else does He do? Is it that complicated? He keeps us alive. Okay. Acts 17, look at Acts 17, 25 and 28. Nor does he need anything that we... And his, Paul speaking to the Athenians about God, the, the true God. Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And then dropping down to verse 28. As some have said, in him we live... And move and exist. It is as some of your po poets have said, we too are his children. So there's step one. We wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for the constant power of the Holy Spirit. What else does he do? In association with his angel assistants, he's constantly seeking, trying to reach out to every human being living on this earth and woo them, draw them, attract them to God. Three, for those who respond to his wooing, he convicts, he converts, and hope eventually he leads to baptism. And then number four, to those who have become true Christians, he gives the gifts of the Spirit. And what are the gifts of the Spirit? <coughs> joy, peace. Yeah, love, joy, peace. Okay, th those are the fruits of the Spirit. What are the, what are the gifts of the Spirit? Yes. Remember? Apostles, prophets, teachers. Yeah. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 12, for example. I want you to know the truth about... Uh, I Now concerning what you wrote about the gifts from the Holy Spirit, I want you to know the truth about them, my brothers and sisters. You know that while you were still heathen, you were led astray in many ways, and I'm going to just drop down. Uh, verse 4, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways to, of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to all for their particular service. Um, so, dropping down to verse 9, one and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person He gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and to yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not, and so forth. And then Ephesians 4 has another list. Uh, maybe we could look at that just very briefly. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, 
others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service. Who's supposed to be doing the work of Christian service? Us. All God's people in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Wow. Imagine growing up to that. So what can we learn from the prayer life of Jesus? Yes, Bob? You know, I think one aspect I haven't heard, I, I like to call it the, the love of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because I see one of the things that he does is the transformation. When we give him permission yep. to come into us to take away that selfishness and put divine love, self-sacrificing love into our hearts as, as our motives, the transformation, the change mm -hmm. that can come about when we daily give permission yep. for him to do that. Jesus felt such an urgent need for the guidance and moment-by-moment moment direction of his heavenly partners, the Father and the Holy Spirit, that he was almost constantly in prayer. Note these important occasions in his ministry when Jesus felt a need for prayer. We've already looked at or talked about Luke 3. After all the people had been baptized, now Jesus had just come down to the River Jordan. He's on the other side of the River Jordan where John is baptizing. Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, coming up out of the water, the other, other Gospels say, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. So what do we have going on here, just immediately after his baptism? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all manifest The Trinity together. is right there, all three members of the Godhead, giving approval to what Jesus is doing, right? Well, Ellen White comments, a new and important era was opening before him. He was now un upon a wider stage entering on the conflict of his life. Desire of Ages 111, page, uh, paragraph 3. Later, Jesus prayed all night in consultation with his Father and the Holy Spirit before choosing his 12 disciples. You remember Luke 6, verse 12. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he named apostles. And, you know, Simon, Peter, Andrew, and so forth and so forth. Don't you think... Tr try to imagine now yourself if you were in that, that committee, the three members of the Godhead. What do you suppose they were doing all night long? You think the father said, choose that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one? Let's discuss it. Let's discuss it. Yeah. Not that they didn't know, Yeah. but let's discuss it. How would they discuss it? They argue, no, that's not a good one? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think they would, I think they probably considered a lot of names. They'd bring up the bad points of Peter, even though he was the yeah. final choice. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think they thought of each of these people very carefully. And I think they probably said to Jesus, now you know, here's the problems with this particular person. These are the things you need to work on. Okay? This is the problem with this person. That's what you need to... And here's why you should not choose that person or you should not choose this person. I, I, think, they had a, I think they had a very... Cool, very productive uh, session. Well, <clears throat> Jesus was not only selecting follow the followers, but also choosing those who would understand and identify completely with his person and his mission, of course, after, he, after the resurrection. Although not convinced of his Godhead and not truly committed to the work they were to do until after his resurrection, when they did realize their mission, most of them would end up being martyrs. What do you suppose would have happened if Jesus said, how many of you want to be a martyr for me? No. What did they think they were being chosen for? Well, Peter thought he would be, would be a martyr. Well, he told them he, he didn't understand what he was saying, but he thought he would be. Yeah. 
Yeah, so a long time later. Wait, uh, wait just a root and tootin' minute here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were, we're talking about the, the Godhead discussing this thing, you know, mm -hmm. and here's the virtues of Peter and that and so mm -hmm. forth. And so I guess Jesus makes the decisions or whatever. Are, are we saying that when it came to Judas, they listed these things and Jesus said, well, we're going to go with him anyway? What do we have? Why he, he selected himself. Jesus didn't choose him. He just he, showed up. Well, he was, I, he's, Jesus is choosing out of a lot of people here. And, and Judas realized, that, hey, you know, we're getting down. There aren't too many more spots left in this group. I, I need to be here. And he, he urged his, read it in Desire of Ages. He urged well, I, his way in. I know that's what it says, but it didn't seem to kind of fit with what we're, yeah. this big discussion. But anyway. Ellen White says their office, this is the disciples, their office was the most important to which human beings had ever been called and was second only to that of Christ himself. Desire of Ages, 291, paragraph 3. Was it more important than Moses, Abraham, and Job? I think so. Mm -hmm. They were starting a new church. They were starting, <coughs> for the first time, they weren't just gathering the family around. They were saying, this message has to go to the whole world. What they didn't realize, it was going to be for a long time, hand, yeah. handed down. I, th I think they had a much clearer picture of what God's character was like yeah. after Jesus' life. Yeah. Well, in Caesarea Philippi, now we're getting quite a ways along in the, in the ministry of Jesus. He has finished his ministry in Judea. He's finished his ministry in Galilee. And now he's spending six months with his disciples outside of Galilean and Judean territory, trying to prepare them for what's coming. And he takes them way up in the north to Caesarea Philippi, a pagan city full of pagan temples and gods, all these other strange gods. And Jesus lets them look around a little while to these displays of human glory and so forth. And then he said to them, what? Do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And what did Peter respond? You are the Christ. Yeah. You're the Christ, the Son of the Living God, right? Well, look at Luke 9, 28 to 36. About a week after he had said these things, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up a hill to pray. While he was praying, his face changed its appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. Now there's something important to note by that particular point. His clothes became dazzling white. This isn't because he just used a new, new, uh, new box of Tide. Uh, what, <laughs> what, what's this telling us here? He's in heavenly presence, you might say. Okay, which is proof God's Spirit came down and entered him, proving that he was not a sinner. This is proof right here that at least at this point in his life, he has still lived a perfect life. God would not have dared to enter the life, the, the body of a sinner. So uh, suddenly the two men who were there talking with him, they were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in heavenly glory and talked with Jesus about the way in which he would soon fulfill God's purpose by dying in Jerusalem. Because they were talking about that. What about... <clears throat> what about somebody who has been converted? Why couldn't God come into their heart and into their life? He will, in time. No, no, no. I mean, like, we're talking here about the Holy Spirit coming in. So which, which person would you like to nominate? You want to nominate one of those three that was up there? I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, never mind. <laughs> we're, we're, well, we're wandering yeah. off into the nature of Jesus here, and that's well. A, but couldn't no. you? Couldn't, uh, I'll take up what you were saying and spread it a little further. <coughs> Does this equate to us here and now? Yeah. Prayer is easier for some people than it is for others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get a direct answer. Sometimes you get an answer totally different, and sometimes you get no answer. Sometimes it's years later. So there's a bit of a difference here. There's an overlap, but I, th I think there is a bit of a difference. Well, my little comment about which would you choose of those three, what does God have to choose from? Yeah. 
He has to choose to work with what's available. Okay. Well, Peter and his companions were sound asleep, but they woke up on Je and saw Jesus' glory and the two men who were standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not really know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and the disciples were afraid as the cloud came over them. A voice said from the cloud, guess what? This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice stopped, there was Jesus all alone. The disciples kept quiet about all this and told no one at that time anything they had seen. Ellen White says that on the way down the mountain, Jesus said to them, don't tell. Why would he tell them not to tell? He would have died before he well, he didn't want any little extra temples built for starters. Okay. That's well, they were already wanting to build a temple yeah. themselves, so if the word got out, there's no telling. He was always having to control that. And, and <coughs> if Jesus said, well, okay, go ahead and tell people about me, and in fact, you just saw me with God's glory on, on me, what would they say? Next thing out goes wrong. Yeah, next thing out. Well, we're on our way to Jerusalem, and what we're going to do? Uber. We're going to crown Jesus King of the Jews. That's exactly what they would have said. Well, was, was the Holy Spirit on them here? And then well, the next the question is, says. if so, why were they afraid? It says they were, the shadow began to kind of come over them, and now how they're many, getting jumpy. How many times in the Bible does it talk about an angel or God appearing to someone? And what happens to every yeah, one of them? Lots of times, but... And what do they do? They become fearful. They fall on their faces. Are, is, are we supposed to do that? Would it, would it have been better if the disciples had embraced the shadow? Of course. Uh, would not have been afraid of it? If they had been prepared, they would have. If they, I mean, wouldn't it have been better if the disciples had stayed awake in the Garden of Gethsemane? Imagine what, what that would be. So when the Holy Spirit shows up, instead of being afraid of the trouble you're going to get into, <laughs> you'd be better off to embrace it? Is that, just Absolutely. go with it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you think is going to happen when there are 144,000 people we talk about in the book of Revelation who are ready to accept the Holy Spirit? This great controversy will be coming to an end. Yes, Gordon. To your point just before about don't tell, it's actually in Mark 9, yeah. 9 yeah. also. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that later, Peter writes about that, and what did he say? With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. Yes. We have not depended on man-made up, made up stories or making known to you the mighty coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With our own eyes, we saw his greatness. With our own eyes, we saw it. Well, then he took his three disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? The others were waiting at the gate. They weren't that far away. But what were they all doing? Sleeping. Let's look at that for just a moment. Luke 22, starting with verse 39. Jesus left the city and went as he usually did. What does that tell us? He frequently went. He was accustomed to going out there to the Garden of Gethsemane. As he usually did to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples went with him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, by the way, that's how Judas knew where to find him, right? When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he went off from them about the distances of a stone, stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, he said, If you will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In great anguish, he prayed even more fervently. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Um, and I, I think we need to take that, those points very seriously. What do you think is happening in his body when his, when his brow is sweating blood? He's near Dying. the end. Things breaking. Are breaking he's dying. Yes. dying. Desire of Ages says specifically he fell dying to the ground. And the angel had to revive him. 
What would have happened if, they ha if the angel had not revived him? He would have had the crucifixion. died right there. He would have died right there, and what would the disciples have to say the next morning? He had a heart attack. Some crazy disease wiped him out. Yeah, it was a crazy disease, but they wouldn't have understood <laughs> what it was. So what was, be what was he demonstrating there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Had anyone beaten him yet? No. Was there any crown of thorns there? No. Had he been tortured? No. Was he had been crucified yet? No. no? And he fell dying to the ground. In other words, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was ready to die of sin right there. Separation. Separation from his father, from the source of life. But he had to go out and go through all that awful stuff that we know that happened later for our benefit, so we would know what kind of a death he, he was going through. The entire universe watched the battle between God and Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was so stressed as he felt his relationship with the Father being broken up that drops of blood came out like sweat and he finally fell dying to the ground, Desire of Ages 693, paragraph 1. It was necessary for an angel from heaven to come and revive him, or he would have died right there, Luke 22, 43. In that prayer, we learn three important things. God's will should be our number one priority at all times. What did Jesus pray? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, right? Number two, like Jesus, we should be committed do, to doing God's will even at the risk of death. Paul said, all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Are we ready for that? Three, God will provide strength to overcome every temptation that the devil can bring upon us. And you know 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Then Jesus had to go through that awful period of arrest, trials, torture, and crucifixion. Once again, he felt his relationship with the Father breaking up, leading him to cry, My God, my God, why did you abandon me? That's the Good News translation, Matthew 27, 46. But Jesus exercising his faith did what? He relied upon the evidence which had heretofore been given him. And when someone relies on the evidence, what do we call that? Faith. Desire of Ages, 756, paragraph E. And even though he had come not, even though he could not see through the portals of the tomb, Desire of Ages, 753, paragraphs 1 and 2, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, in your hands I place my spirit. He said this and died. So what's going on here? Jesus is saying, I don't care how awful things seem right now to me. I can't see my father. Elsewhere, Ellen White says, the, 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 the terrible distress he felt as a result of being separated from the father was so bad that he, he, his physical pain was hardly felt. That's, that's, I think that's the same page, seven, Desire of Ages 753. On two different occasions, Jesus gave us a model prayer. Talking, remember, we're focusing on prayer here. To use as an example of how we should pray. You know the prayer in Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Well, we add more to it. Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. And that's the end. What happened to the rest of it? It was added. Well, later, the church felt it was appropriate, since many people love this prayer, that they should add a nice doxo doxology at the end. Now, does that mean uninspired material is being put in here? No. There's some beautiful doxology. There's one at the end of Jude. There's some, Solomon gave a gorgeous doxology at the end of his dedication ceremony at the, sermon at the temple, back in, in Chron Kings and Chronicles. So, you know, the, the church just said, well, let's put a doxology in right in here. So they did. But that's not all. There are two different givings of this prayer. 
Jesus didn't intend for us to just memorize it wholesale like that and repeat it. And when Luke repeats this, what does he do? Does he do anything different than this? We pray, Our Father in heaven. Luke leaves out the hour, and he leaves out the in heaven. He just says, Father, when he gives this story. Now, that's later in his ministry when he gave that, his, that story. And when he comes down to verse, what we, well, it would be Matthew, equivalent of Matthew. Well, maybe I should take you over to the Luke passage <coughs> so you can see it for yourself. Luke 11, 2 to 4. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. Give us day by day the food we need. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone who, done, who does us wrong and do not bring us to hard testing. What's missing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll be done. Where's the... Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where is that? Where's, Thy yeah. will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not there. It's not there in Luke. That should be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, the, that's what the, the Bible writers thought too. So yeah. they, they said it's over there in Matthew. We, we need to put it here in Luke. And they just... Later Bible writers, later copyists, just said, it needs to be there. Joel, you should have been there. You would have yes. put it in there for them. Yes. And so we end up with a complete prayer with the doxologies and the hours and the in, our Father in heaven in there. It's, it's like that in the, in the more traditional translations. So um, does it bother you that some words are different in Luke than they are in Matthew? Shouldn't Jesus, maybe Jesus couldn't remember. Is that the problem? I doubt it. No. Again, it wasn't a memorization that we were It wasn't intended to, to be a memorized thing, no. It was just an example. Pray these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. I think it makes it more real because human people, we don't remember everything verbatim. I could whisper something to you when it mm-hmm. gets to carry, it'll, be, it'll change somewhat. Mm-hmm. I think if everything was exactly the same, it would be a little bit suspect. But I still question things that look, sometimes I question things that look like they're saying something totally different to me, sometimes. We must, however, remember that praying in God's name is not the only key to salvation. What did Matthew say in Matthew 7, 20, what did Jesus say is recorded in Matthew 7, 21 and 23? Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. Doesn't it sound like a good thing? By your name we drove out many demons. I mean, that's power, right? And performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? Get away from me, you wicked people. What's hard to imagine is they could do those things and still be wicked. Yeah. Well, the incredible thing is that apparently Judas went out with the other disciples and performed. I mean, Jesus gave them the power to (coughs) cast out demons, cleanse leopards, raise the dead. Did Judas do that? I think so. But maybe we're going to see stuff like that really at the end of time. It's easy to see with the picture of God, this lessons portraying of how God is with prayer, that how we often see prayer nowadays is so different. Mm -hmm. This is a relationship based, whereas a lot of people pray to get things to for specific items and prayer can be also a relationship builder. To, 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 To many people, unfortunately, Prayer is, look, here's my grocery list for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know? It also shows an order of initially giving <coughs> glory to God, mm-hmm. asking that His will be done. So we're focusing yeah. outwardly to Him mm-hmm. first. Yeah. And then uh, after we have done that, then we ask for, for the necessities. Our, na- our needs, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's an, a, a sequence of, of things in well, prayer. Luke goes on to say something else, which is quite remarkable. Look at Luke 11, verse 9. And so I say to you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For all those who ask will receive. And those who seek will find. And the door will be opened to anyone who knocks. 
Would any of you who are fathers give your son or a snake when he asks for fish? Or would you give him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? Bad as you are, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more then will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Pretty remarkable, huh? Well, does persistent prayer change God? Or does it change us? More likely the latter. We spoke briefly last week about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Think about these two characters. The Holy, I mean, the Pharisee comes out there, and, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like these sinners over here gathered <laughs> around. You know, please don't let them get too close to me. I don't need to be contaminated, right? And what does the tax collector say? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this man was a son of Abraham, wasn't he? The tax collector, as well as the Pharisee. Well, Jesus goes on to say meekness. Yes, go ahead. We got oh, a minute left. It seems like that prayer. I could pray that prayer daily. Yeah. Meekness and lowliness, I'm reading from Prophets and Kings, page 590, paragraph 2. Meekness and lowliness are the conditions of success and victory. A crown of glory awaits those who bow at the foot of the cross. Have you ever been tempted to look around you and compare yourself with others? Does God grade on the curve? Or does it even matter that how many other people may truly be worse off spiritually than you are? And then I read again, the soul that turns to God for its help, its support, its power, by daily earnest prayer will have noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth and duty, lofty purposes of action, and a continual hungering and thirsting after righteousness. By maintaining a connection with God, we shall be enabled to diffuse to others, through our association with them, the light, the peace, the serenity that rule in our hearts. The strength acquired in prayer to God, united with persevering effort and training the mind in thoughtfulness and caretaking, prepares one for daily duties and keeps the spirit in peace under all circumstances. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, 85, paragraph 2. I hope that this time of talking about Jesus, his prayer life, and the Holy Spirit has been a blessing to all. Our kind and loving Father, after listening to this short discourse on prayer as presented in your word in the Gospels and to the handwriting of Ellen White. What can we say about prayer except, Lord, teach us to pray, just as the disciples said. May our prayers be more meaningful. May they be more righteous and closer to your will for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.